Quote, Instrumental music, remarks Zephyrus, in the religious worship of the Jews, belong to the ceremonial law which is now abolished. It is evident that it is contrary to the precept and rule of Paul, who, in 1 Corinthians 14, wills that in Christian assemblies everything should be done for edification, that others may understand and be reformed. So even that of speaking in unknown tongues should be banished from the church, much less should that jarring organic music, which produceth a gabbling of many voices, be allowed, with its pipes and trumpets and whistles, making our churches resound, nay, bellow and roar. In some of the reformed churches, these musical instruments are retained, but they are not played until the congregation is dismissed, all the parts of divine worship being finished, and they are then used for a political, civil purpose, to gratify those who seek pleasure from sound and harmony." Unquote. Mollerus, on the 150th Psalm, observes, quote, It is no wonder, therefore, that such a number of musical instruments should be so heaped together. But although they were a part of the, the pedagogia legalis, the instruction of the law, yet they were not for that reason to be brought into Christian assemblies. For God willeth that, after the coming of Christ, his people should cultivate the hope of eternal life, and the practice of true piety be very different and more simple means than these, unquote. The three foregoing testimonies are extracted from the report of a committee to the Presbytery of Glasgow in 1808. Gisbertus Photius argues at length against the use of instrumental music in churches in his ecclesiastical polity, a work which is held in high estimation among the Presbyterians. The argument is characterized by the great ability for which the author was noted, but it is too elaborate to be here cited. It might seem hopeless to get from the Church of England a testimony against the employment of instruments and music, but when her first love was warmed by the blessed influence of the Reformation from Popery, she spoke in no uncertain sounds on the subject. In her homily, quote, of the place and time of prayer, unquote, these notable words occur, quote, God's vengeance hath been and is daily provoked, because much wicked people pass nothing to resort to the Church. Either for that they are so sore blinded that they understand nothing of God or godliness, and care not with devilish example to offend their neighbors, or else for that they see the church altogether scoured of such gay, gazing sights as their gross fantasy was greatly delighted with, because they see the false religion abandoned and the true restored, which seemeth an unsavory thing to their unsavory taste, as may appear by this, that a woman said to her neighbor, Alas, gossip! What shall we now do at church, since all the saints are taken away? Since all the goodly sights we were wont to have are gone, since we cannot hear the like piping, singing, chanting, and playing upon the organs that we could before. But, dearly beloved, we ought greatly to rejoice and give God thanks that our churches are delivered out of all those things which displeased God so sore, and filthily defiled his holy house and his place of prayer." Unquote. The thirty-two godly and learned commissioners appointed by King Edward the Sixth to reform ecclesiastical laws and observances submitted the following advice. Quote, in reading chapters and singing psalms, ministers and clergymen must think of this diligently, that God is not only to be praised by them, but that others are to be brought to perform the same worship by their counsel and example. Wherefore, let them produce their words distinctly, and let their singing be clear and easy, that everything may be understood by the auditors. So that tis our pleasure that the quavering or opposed music, the operos music, excuse me, which is called figured, should be wholly laid aside, since it often makes such a noise in the ears of the people that they cannot understand what is said, unquote. Quote, certainly, says Ames, in answer to the taunts of Dr. Burgess, these were neither distracted nor stupid men, whence their prejudice came. Let the rejoinder himself judge." Unquote. Quote, in the English convocation held in the year 1562, in Queen Elizabeth's time, for settling the liturgy, the retaining of the custom of kneeling at the sacrament, of the cross in baptism, and of organs carried on by the casting vote. Unquote. Hetherington's account of the matter is as follows. Quote, in the beginning of the year 1562, a meeting of the convocation was held in which the subject of further reformation was vigorously discussed on both sides. Among the alterations proposed was this, quote, that the use of organs be laid aside, unquote. When the vote came to be taken on these propositions, 43 voted for them and 35 against. But when the proxies were counted, the balance was turned, 
the final state of the vote being 58, 4, and 59 against. Thus it was determined by a single vote, and that, the proxy of an absent person who did not hear the reasoning, that the prayer book should remain unimproved, that there should be no further reformation, and that there should be no relief granted to those whose consciences felt aggrieved by the admixture of human inventions in the worship of God." Unquote. In 1564, during Queen Elizabeth's reign, considerable discussion was had touching the use of vestments in public worship. Bishop Horn wrote to Galter at Zurich about the matter. He and Bullinger replied to him, recommending moderation whereupon Samson and Humphrey, in February 1565, wrote to the Zurich divines, giving, quote, a copious account of the grounds on which they founded their refusal to obey, unquote, the orders of the Queen and Parliament. Bullinger answered them by again recommending moderation. In a footnote, one is here reminded of Luther's works, uh, Luther's words, quote, too much discretion is displeasing to God, unquote. This letter of Bullinger to Samson and Humphrey was sent to Horn and Grindel, who published it, quote, Upon this, Samson and Humphrey wrote to Zurich, complaining of the printing their letter, and carried their complaints much further than to the matter of, their of the vestments. They complained of the music and organs, of making sponsors and baptism answer in the child's name, of the court of faculties, and the praying for dispensations, unquote. These facts are sufficient to show that the Church of England was at one time on the verge of eliminating instrumental music, along with other relics of popery from her public services, and she had been thoroughly reformed in accordance with the wishes of her purest divines, she would have conformed her practice, in this matter, to that of the reformed churches on the continent. But the taste and the will of an arbitrary female head of the Church determined her usages in a contrary direction. The history deserves to be pondered most seriously. What were the views of the English Puritans on this subject has already been indicated when the question was under consideration in regard to the position assumed concerning it by the Westminster Assembly of Divines. It is not necessary to exhibit their sentiments by further appeals to authority. To their almost unanimous opposition to instrumental music in the public worship of God as unscriptural and popish, there were some exceptions, among whom was the justly celebrated Richard Baxter, a great man, but neither a great Calvinist nor a great Presbyterian. Those who wish to see his arguments in favor of a temperate employment of instrumental music in church worship can find them in the fifth volume of his works, edited by Oram, page 499, arguments about as weak as those by which he attempted to support the Grotian theory of the atonement. As they may to some extent be considered in the examination of the arguments in favor of instrumental music, they will not be noticed in this place. I cannot pass from this reference to the English Puritans without, pa without pausing to express the conviction that whatever may have been some of their peculiar characteristics, and even these have been magnified and caricatured by opponents who were partly or wholly destitute of their religious earnestness, no pure exponents of the truth of God as set forth in the Holy Scriptures have existed on earth since the days of the Apostles and the growing defection from the views they maintained touching the purity of worship which now conspicuously marks the English-speaking non-prelatic churches carries in it the ominous symptoms of apostasy from the gospel. Some few yet stand firm against what is now called, in a painfully significant phrase, the, quote, downgrade, unquote, tendencies of this age. Prominent among them is that eminent servant of Christ, a star in his right hand, the Reverend Charles H. Spurgeon, who has not who not only proclaims with power the pure doctrines of God's word but retains and upholds an apostolic simplicity of worship the great congregation which is blessed with the privilege of listening to his instructions has no organ to assist them in singing their praises to their god and savior they find their vocal organs sufficient their tongues and voices express the gratitude of their hearts it is almost needless to cite the example of the church of scotland she was with the exception of an unholy alliance between the church and the state, a baneful source of incalculable evils. Quote, a spring of woes unnumbered, to the former, uh, unquote, to the former, a glorious instance of a church as completely reformed as could be expected in this present, imperfect, and premillennial condition. 
Even the permissive liturgy of John Knox she soon threw off as a swathing band from her free limbs, and for centuries she knew nothing of instrumental music in her public services. Would that she now retained this primitive purity in worship. But within a half century back, in consequence of the agitation persistently pursued by some who clamored for a more artistic celebration of worship, the established church relaxed its testimony and consented to make the question of instrumental music an open one. That is, the matter was left to the opinion of individual congregations. Meanwhile, the free church stood firm and has so stood until recently. Dr. Begg, in his work on organs, could express his gratitude for the conservative attitude of his church on the subject, and Dr. Candlish deprecated the discussion of the question as fraught with peril. But they have fallen asleep, and the church of their love is now, by the action of her presbyteries, making it an, quote, open question, unquote. The floodgates are up, and the result is by no means uncertain. The experience of the American Presbyterian Church will be that of the Scottish. The Irish Presbyterian Church has for years seriously debated the question in her General Assembly. So far she has refused to make it an open one, but the pressure of a heavy minority, it may almost with certainty be expected, will prevail in breaking through the dikes of scriptural conservatism. The fact, however, that to the present hour that noble church maintains its opposition to instrumental music contributes no unimportant element to the historical argument against its use. It is likely that the question has never been subjected to so thoroughgoing an examination as it has met in the protracted discussions of her Supreme Court. She is now almost the last great witness for the simple singing of praise in public worship. Should the standard of her testimony go down, it must be left so excuse me, it must be left to small, seceded bodies or to individuals to continue the witness bearing and the contest for a simplicity of worship from the majority in the church from which the majority in the church have apostatized. The non-prolatic churches, independent and Presbyterian, began their development on the American continent without instrumental music. They followed the English Puritans and the Scottish Church, which had adopted the principles of the Calvinistic Reformed Church. How the organ came to be gradually introduced into them, it were bootless to inquire. They began right, but have more and more departed from the simple genius of Christian worship. On what grounds have they done this, it would be well for them to stop and inquire. But if there be any force in argument, their present position cannot be maintained. It is a clear departure from the practice of the Church, both early and reformed. The United Presbyterian Church has but recently given way. A respectable minority opposes the defection. But what the issue will be, events do not yet furnish sufficient data to determine. The Associate Reformed Church has not yet receded from the pure principles and practice of their forefathers. May God grant them grace to continue in their maintenance. The time may ere long come when those who stand on these principles and refuse to yield to the demands of a latitudinarian age will be attracted by adherence to a common sentiment towards a formal union with each other. It may be made a question whether the retention of a pure gospel worship does not constitute a reason for the existence of a distinctive organization. It has thus been proved, by an, appear, uh, by an appeal to historical facts, that the Church, although lapsing more and more into defection from the truth and into a corruption of apostolic practice, had no instrumental music for 1,200 years, and that the Calvinistic Reformed Church ejected it from its services as an element of popery, even the Church of England having come very nigh to its extrusion from her worship. The historical argument, therefore, combines with the scriptural and the confessional to raise a solemn and powerful protest against its employment by the Presbyterian Church. It is heresy in the sphere of worship. <laughs>